Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this EU circular talk on the Waste Framework Directive, paving the way for a circular textiles industry. My name is Marie-Jeanne Gartner, and I work for Reuse, the international network of social enterprises active in repair, reuse, and recycling, and I will be the moderator of today's event. Uh, before we start, I would like to share a few housekeeping rules. Please keep your microphones and cameras turned off, also uh, the speakers, when you're not speaking. And uh, to the participants, feel free to ask your questions uh, throughout the event in the chat. We will try to address as much as we can at the end of the session. On behalf of Reuse and of the co-organizer of this event, Eurocommerce, Euric, Genesha Climate Europe, and of course the European Economic and Social Committee, I can say that I'm very happy to see many of you, of you joining today's event. The purpose of our event is to foster the discussion about a burning topic, uh, which is the introduction of mandatory harmonized uh, extending producer responsibility schemes for textiles at EU level. We know that textile waste management will soon face major changes, uh, namely the mandatory separate collection entering into force in 2025, followed by the introduction of EPR schemes as mandated by the Commission's proposal for the revision of the Waste Framework Directive. So this is precisely what we want to address today with the following speakers. Um, so I will now present you the agenda of today's event. We'll first hear some opening remarks from the reporter of the EESC's opinion on the WFD. We'll hear their views on the Commission's proposal. Charles Kukedi will be followed by Vincenzo Gente, policy officer at DG Environment, who will present the main aspect of the Commission's proposal for a revision of the Waste Framework Directive related to textiles. Finally, to look into concrete implementation models, uh, we will hear from Sina Despireux from the German Environmental Agency, who will present the main insight from their report on EPR models. The second part of our event will be a panel discussion, which will gather stakeholders from all across the value chain. We will name, um, hear the perspective from retailers, recyclers, municipalities and social enterprises. We will hear their perspective on the challenges and opportunities raised by the introduction of uh, EPR schemes. Um, I invite all our speakers to keep their presentation quite short and respect the dedicated time to ensure that we will have a lively discussion at the end of the webinar. I would now like to invite our first speaker to take the floor. Good afternoon, Solj Kikeri. Uh, can you please describe your role at the ESC and present to the participants the key takeaways of the ESC opinion on the proposal for a revision of the Waste Framework Directive? The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome all of you and thank Mary Jane, Alice, Lucas, Marco and Jana, Clara, all those who collaborated in the organization of this EU circular talk on the revision of the Waste Framework Directive as regards of the textile waste. Holding open dialogues with the stakeholders uh, is what the European Economic and Social Committee and the European Commission had in mind when they set the European Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform in uh, 2017. Soon after its inception, the platform, the network of networks, has established itself as the platform for the circular economy community where, the, where we can dialogue the bridge uh, uh, and bridge existing circular economy initiatives. It allowed for the sharing of hundreds of good practices, knowledge pieces, and many events submitted to the platform since 2017. And it is free and accessible to all, so you can understand it its high value regarding security. The ESC, the role of the organized city society, is composed of three groups, employers, workers, with trade unionists and, and representatives of civil society organizations. The ESC represents civil society and at EU decision-making level, serving as an adversary body at EU level. The ESC prepares options on the EU issues to the European Commission, the Council, and uh, of the Europe uh, of the of the EU, 
and the European Parliament, thus acting as a bridge between the EU decision-making institutions and EU citizens. The voice of the civil society, therefore, at the core of the ESC, uh, a fact which is also reflected in the European economy, European circular economy stakeholder platform. Today, I am here as a, mem a member of the ESC and the reporter of the ESC opinion on the revision of the Waste Framework Directive. The subject where we are about to, to approach future waste management policies is a critical element for the green transition of the textile and clothing value chain. We can understand its importance from the analysis and data collected in different joint research center studies. The representative of the EU Commission will share more data on textile, from which I would like to share with you only two important data. We produce generally 12 kilograms per person textile waste per year in the EU. About 22% of post-customer textile waste, which accounts for 87 of the textile waste generated, is collected separately, mainly for reuse or recycling while the rest is incinerated or landfilled. Despite progress, we can deduce that separate collection, sorting and recycling in the EU are at present inf insufficient to handle the additional quantities expected once the separate collection obligation materialize on January 1st, 2025, and textile consumption continues to grow. The EU Commission highlighted in its impact assessment that the problem stemmed from a regulatory market and behavior drivers such as funding gap to scale up the reuse and recycling system, regulatory uncertainty on the application of the definitions of the textiles and textile waste, and fast fashion trends flooding the market with low-cost clothing and textiles. Therefore, the main measures proposed by the European Commission was the introduction of the extended producer responsibility shame for textiles, textile-related and footwear products, and harmonized rules for its application. In our opinion, the ESC opinion, we support the mandatory introduction of extended responsibility shame for textile products. Indeed, we consider that the uniform producer responsibility shame substantially impact the placing on the market, repair and reuse of durable and high quality textiles within the, within the EU. Nevertheless, it, it calls for ESC opinion calls for a review to ensure that the current legislation can be implemented from a practical point of view. Indeed, we consider not appropriate that the leg legislative proposal treats used clothes, products, and textile waste uniformly in the provision of Article 22D. Moreover, we, we consider it necessary to clarify the legislation of, on, the pre, uh, on, the preven, on the prevention of textile waste, which allows the deduction from the producer's EPR fee of revenues from the sale of secondary raw materials originating from this waste. We emphasize the importance of the polluter price principle uniformly applied in the case of, of the manufacturers of different market sizes as, as well too, because every manufacturer is uniformly responsible for the pollution they cause. Finally, allow me to say that we also emphasize separately that the shipments of waste, shipment of waste from Europe to non-European countries for the purpose of landfilling must be prohibited. These are just some of our main conclusions and recommendations that we addressed to the co-legislators. There is more to say about this opinion, and invite, I invite you to consult it along with the ESC-related work in the context of circular economy. To conclude, I'm delighted to open this webinar and participate in this dialogue, which deals with the critical factor of, of the green transition for textiles. I look forward to a fruitful exchange in this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charles, for this uh, introduction. We already heard uh, quite a lot of comments from your side on the uh, revision for the WFD. And now we will hear from the Commission, from Vincenzo, uh, actually what is on the table in the, in the proposal. So, Vincenzo, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for introduction. I'm sharing now the slides for my presentation. Well, good afternoon. 
to everybody. Just a moment, the slides are coming. Um, I will, uh, uh, I'm Vincenzo Gent, I'm, I'm working uh, as a policy officer in DG Environment in the unit uh, dealing, uh, from, uh, from, from dealing about waste, it's called From Waste to Resources. And I will present briefly present to you today the Commission proposal for a target amendment of the Waste Framework Directive. Uh, the, we, at the moment, I'm just presenting what the proposal is, so what was adopted by the Commission in uh, uh, July this year, 2023. So all the other recommendations and comments that uh, uh, other uh, institutions will provide to us will be dealt within the appropriate um, interinstitutional negotiations. So at the moment, this is what has been already adopted by the Commission. So just to give you uh, the um, background, uh, the um, amendment, the target amendment West from our directive is focusing on two main sectors, which is textiles and food, the very intense sectors, and they are in line with the European Green Deal uh, commitments to reduce waste generation and to uh, facilitate a transition to a circular economy. Uh, in this presentation, I will just focus on the textile uh, provisions that are included in the uh, targeted amendment of the West from Alternative. Um, for textile, as, uh, as I was saying, the, the Circular Economy Action Plan and the EU Strategy for Sustainable and Circular uh, Textile the so-called textile strategy already uh, called uh, for uh, um, to, to ac the Commission to accelerate and reinforce uh, the actions to uh, reduce waste generation, to prevent textile waste, and to improve uh, uh, circular, um, circularity of textiles uh, by promoting uh, um, uh, sustainable practices within the sector. Um, at the same, uh, the Commission came up with a proposal uh, to amend just few articles of the West Framework uh, Directive that is in force uh, following the revision of 2018. So it's, we are not going to, um, the, the, the proposal is not going to um, address uh, uh, the, the West Framework Directive in, in a broad sense, but only to uh, address the textile and food issue. So just to have a, a brief uh, view of uh, the um, what textile waste represent in figures. You can see in the slide and in the um, in the picture in the slide that uh, the European consumption textile has one of the highest impact in terms of uh, environment and climate change after food, housing and mobility. So it's one of the most uh, important sectors to be addressed if you want to reduce uh, consumption, um, if you want to reduce environmental impact and also address climate change. Um, um, uh, the uh, waste coming from textile, it's still, uh, very high. There are 2.6 million tons of textile waste generated per year in the EU, and 5.2 uh, of this, uh, 5 million of these 12.6 12, 12 are uh, clothing and footwear. Unfortunately, only 20% of post-consumer post textile waste is at the moment uh, separated collecting uh, for the user recycling, even because uh, the obligation in the West from a directive to a separate collection system in place for uh, textile and member states will start 2020, January 2025, we'll see afterwards. And one last point is that uh, anyway, the youth textile sector is uh, very important in terms of uh, number of companies and uh, turnover, which is more than 191 billion, it was 191 billion in 2021. So uh, the uh, Commission proposal is uh, taking responsibility on the managing uh, management of textile waste. Um, we'll see three main uh, elements. Uh, the new definitions that be introduced uh, to clarify uh, some of the elements uh, that are uh, of key importance uh, when managing uh, textile waste. The proposed extended producer responsibility for these tags and some of the new rules uh, that we are proposing on the waste management of the style. So as it regards the uh, uh, new definitions, uh, the uh, 
Article 3 of uh, the um, uh, revised uh, West Framework Directive introduces, as you can see, uh, some main important definition. One, the most, one of the most important one is what is we consider as producer, in particular producer of textile, textile related and footwear products listed in Annex 4.C because uh, the EPRs, the extended producer responsibility, will apply only to those produce the producer of textiles, so they are the one that also uh, are linked with the products that are set in the Annex 4.C of the revised directive. We clarify what does it mean making available on the market uh, the textile products, and then we uh, also introduce the pro um, producer responsibility organization, what an online platform is, and what we consider as consumers. These are very important elements to understand better than um, to um, the scope of the other provisions set out in the uh, West from Material Directive. Uh, for what uh, concerns responsibility, responsibility of textile, these are uh, set in Article 2022A mainly, um, and partly in 2022B as it regards the uh, producer register. So the main um, point of uh, this uh, of the West from Directive is that it uh, set up uh, in a, a, a EPR scheme for producers uh, of textile products uh, when they made available for the first time in a member states uh, their products. So this is already focused very much where um, the, the range of application of the EPR schemes. And member states have to ensure that the producer will cover the costs of uh, uh, the collection of used and waste products and also the waste management. This is clearly set and this will uh, also imply that uh, EPRs will become um, responsible for the management of the waste they produce and we expect also to see that in the long term um, they will uh, um, address uh, also not only the waste part of the, the end of pipe of the management of waste textile, but also how to design textile in, in a more uh, sustainable way. And the Article 2020B of the uh, of the uh, the, uh, the directive uh, it uh, calls for the members uh, for the Commission to. Uh, um, draft, implement, adopt, implemented acts for an anonymized format of the registration for the producers. In short, to and to in order to ensure that uh, across you there is an anonymization approach to this. Uh, there is something uh, linked to the standard producer responsibility. There are also the producer responsibility organizations. Uh, producer must, in according to the Article 2020C, designate a, uh, what we call PRO, so a, an organization uh, made of uh, producers, um, to fulfill the the, on their behalf the obligation of the set out by the EPRs. Um, the um, uh, the uh, producer, uh, the pros, the producer uh, responsibility organization have to assure that the uh, producer will pay the fees and these fees are uh, uh, intended to be uh, paid according to uh, a sort of echo modulation. This echo modulation will be um, uh, better defined uh, um, in the, uh, through the echo design for sustainable products uh, regulation for which uh, provisional agreements just be reached this night. And in this way, um, the fees will be uh, modulated according also the uh, sustainability uh, of uh, the textiles uh, products. And then uh, the uh, one of main important points for the pros is that they have to put in place separate collection systems and uh, they will have to use uh, a sorting system in accordance with harmonized sorting requirements uh, that are based on end of west criteria. There is a study ongoing by the GRC on these specific issues. The last point is the rules on textile waste uh, management. Uh, just as I said in the beginning, uh, there is already an obligation for uh, member states to set, put in place separate collection textile by January 2025 in the uh, waste um, framework directive that is uh, in force at the moment.
So they uh, propose a uh, new obligation and they will help member states to uh, achieve better um, uh, collection of uh, um, used and waste textiles. So separate collection, collected textile products are set waste, are defined waste as upon collection. They will be sorted, as I said before, uh, according to minimum requirements uh, for reuse, recycling, in line with the waste hierarchy. And then the, uh, and the another important uh, uh, aspect linked to this is the uh, obligation um, is that by better defining uh, uh, um, all these aspects related to uh, waste management and uh, in uh, in um, by improving uh, some uh, of the obligation regarding inspections. The waste uh, framework directive uh, is also looking at reducing illegal shipment of waste that is at the moment disguised for use. Uh, so these are the main elements uh, and this is the structure of the legal proposal. I, I went through a little bit all the articles, uh, um, article 3 is on definition, 22A for the APR, uh, 20B for producer register, 20, 20, uh, 22C it's for the uh, pros, uh, 20, 20, 22D it's for managing textile waste and then in the annex you can see uh, the product the scope uh, within the extended producer responsibility and in article 37 you have all the uh, requirement reportings. One point that I would like also to mention is that the fees that will be collected via DPR schemes are also supposed to uh, um, trigger research and innovation uh, and uh, we look at uh, innovation aspects, particularly related to the sorting of uh, different textile uh, used and uh, waste textiles, and also to improve uh, uh, the recycling process to make more efficient, um, and in particular with the fiber to fiber recycling uh, schemes. Uh, these uh, are also in line with the proposed, uh, with the candidate European uh, partnership on uh, textile for the future that has been proposed under uh, Horizon Europe. So with this I've uh, finished, I hope I stayed within the time and I give the floor back to the chair. Thank you very much uh, Vincenzo for uh, summarizing the key aspect of the Commission's proposal. Uh, we heard that the revised WFD will introduce new rules for member states to manage textile waste. Uh, notably the introduction of EPR schemes. We heard previously from the ESC the importance of ensuring the practical implementation of EPR schemes, which is why uh, I would like to welcome our next speaker, uh, Sina De Pierre, who will explain uh, what they are doing at the European, um, sorry, German Environmental Agency with regard to designing scenarios for EPR schemes. So the floor is yours, Tina. Thanks. I will wait for the slides. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Sina Depiru and I work on the German Environment Agency. And I work on the topic of textile waste in Germany, especially on the collection and treatment of textile waste. And we develop different EPR models, which I will present now. On the next slide, uh, first of all, the extended producer responsibility affects the whole textile cycle uh, from production to consumption and so on. But I will mainly focus on collection and recycling or recovery today. On the next slide, uh, you will see some data. Um, please, the next slide on page four, yes. There are 1.62 million tons of textiles put on the market in uh, 2021. Um, mainly clothing, home textiles, shoes, leather goods, bags, backpacks and other goods. And uh, we collected around about 1 million tons of old textiles in Germany that results in a collection rate of nearly 62% because we have a voluntary collection system already established here in Germany. 
but also the mandatory separate collection of used textiles from 2025 laid down in the German Circular Economy Act and to be perceived by the public disposal providers later. Um, the disposal system is currently mainly financed by second-hand sales, but due to increasing quantities and decreasing qualities of collected textiles, the disposal will be no longer financially viable in the future. You can see the price range is going down. So a disposal problem is looming in Germany. On the next slide there, I will tell you something about the collection system. We mainly collect the old textiles via brink bank containers. They represent nearly 90 to 95 percent. And the take back in the retail or in the shops are only 1.7 percent. The main collector is the commercial or the private uh, sector with 44 percent followed by the social enterprises with nearly 29% and the public disposal provider with 27%. So again, the voluntary take back from the producers and the retail are very low, only 0.5%. Uh, On the next slide, there will be some effects about the recycling and recovery in Germany. We have no fiber to fiber recycling implemented on a large scale yet. And mostly there's a downcycling of used textiles to cleaning racks and ripped goods. In 2018, you can see that 62% was a reuse, so secondhand clothes. 14% uh, are cleaning racks and 12% are for the recycling industry and 8% goes to the energy recovery. The textile waste have not yet been specifically regulated with regard to resource conserving waste management. So the requirements in the German Circular Economy Act are not sufficient as the municipal systems are primarily designed for collection and not for recycling or recovery. So there was a recommendation that we should introduce a re extended producer responsibility as it has the greatest positive effects on the promoting the textile circular economy. So in a research project, we developed four different models of extended producer responsibility for textiles. On the next slide, uh, the research project give us some recommendations to the scope. That means that all textiles that typically, typically occurs in the private household should be included in the scope. This means clothing and accessoires, shoes, home textiles, here without carpets and mattresses, and pillows and blankets. Special textiles like textiles with uh, personal protective equipment, uniforms, and so on, uh, need to be uh, separated, considered, because um, there is also research needed and we should exclude textiles for animals or dolls and within product groups, individual products should be excluded, such as ski or ice skates, wiping clothes, cleaning clothes and so on. So the research project developed four models. Model one is a fund model, model two is a producer-led model, model three is systems and competition, and model four is a contract, contract model. On the next slide, shortly the introduction of model one, the fund model. There is an establishment of a central fund management agency, and the fees based on the textiles placed on the market uh, graduated according to ecological criteria and the direct financing from the fund is there where uh, support is needed, for example, for sorting or recycling these textiles. Model two on the next slide is the producer-led model. The organizational and financing responsibility 
is obliged by producers and it's a non-profit organization. Uh, the requirements for collection preparation for reuse and recycling as well as communication and information and innovation are laid down and a self-collection is possible or a participation in the jointly operated system and a central register controls all the information and there's also a sub-model model 2b where the public disposal providers can collect uh, the old textiles as it is said in the German uh, Circular Economy Act from 2025 onwards. So we have to keep that in mind. Model three on the next slide uh, are systems in competition. Producers must generally participate in one or more systems with all the textiles and several systems um, are in competition, uh, but need uh, approval by the competent authority. And all the informations are in the central register. And here we have specific and verifiable requirements for the systems defined by law. And there's a very specific and restrictive restrictive as well as verifiable requirements for the self-collection uh, laid down in the law. The last model is the contract model on the next slide. <clears throat> there are no specific organizational structures defined by law. There are no system approvals or system participation obligations and each producer must choose its contractual partners and structure the contracts with the third parties in such a way that the legal requirements are fulfilled. And all informations are in a central register. Yes, and on the next slide you can see an evaluation of the four models. Um, with the help of different uh, criteria, which you can find on the left hand side. And we gave them four points to zero points. And in the end, it shows that model one, the fund model is less suitable. It was usually rated positively and neutrally, but there will be extremely high bureaucratic and organizational effort that we don't uh, focus on this model. Model two, the producer-led model is more suitable, mostly rated positively and very positively, but here we have antitrust aspects that still need to be clarified. And model three, the systems in competition is suitable, mostly positively or neutrally rated, but here eco-modulation is limited. So we have to focus on we have to focus on a specific way for the eco-modulation here. And model four, the contract model, is less suitable. As you know, the waste framework, framework directive proposal um, is not suitable here for this model. So the next steps on the next slide are now that the federal ministry has to decide which model is the best one for Germany. And then the discussion of the proposals of the amendment of the race framework directive at, at European Union level has to be done by the federal ministry. And when we decided for one model, then with, the, with us, the German Environment Agency, we design the selected model for practical aspects. So thank you for your attention and I'm open for questions, notes and comments and feel free to email me. Thank you very much, Tina, and thank you to all our three first speakers for already setting the scene for our discussion. We already learned uh, more about the new rules for textile management at EU level. We also hear that, uh, heard that implementation will be key 
And on that note, we already um, gained some insight on concrete Im implementation uh, on the German uh, system. Uh, that was very insightful to hear uh, your recommendation and especially uh, to hear from already concrete four different uh, scenario. So without uh, further ado, let's move on to our panel discussion. Today we have a wide variety of stakeholders all across the textile value chain that are here to raise uh, the impact that future EPR schemes will have on their activities and we will learn how to they think they could get the best out of those EPR schemes according to their perspective. I would like to open the panel by inviting Stephanie Bay to take the floor. Hello, Stephanie. Uh, could you first of all describe shortly your organization, Decathlon, and explain to us what part of the textile value chain you're working in and how your activities will be impacted by EPR schemes? Yes, thank you, Marie-Jeanne, for inviting uh, us to be the retail representative. Uh, I'm Stephanie Bailly, I'm an EPR project manager, and I'm also a board member of Refashion in France. And um, we are also part of the building of the, of the scrap in Spain. So uh, first, we, we welcome the, the revision of the Waste Framework uh, Directive, and we are a strong support of uh, the, the building of EPR through all Europe. It is really important for us. Uh, who we are? Well, uh, first, this is who we are. This is a T-shirt made of recycled fibers. Uh, it has been designed in our company by our teams, uh, then produced with uh, partner um, and uh, partners, and then uh, we have our own logistics, and then we sell our in uh, our own product in our own stores. So we are a fully integrated uh, company and uh, we are very proud of our products. Um, so we, we touch 87 million of customers through all Europe uh, with online and, um, and stores. Um, we, we strongly uh, believe that the, the retail mode is actually changing, and this is why we, we are starting to, to have a circular strategy. We have been exploring a lot, uh, and we believe that tomorrow it will be mandatory to, to be a circular company. Uh, this is why we see uh, the extended um, producer uh, responsibility as a very uh, good support for our circular strategy. And we, we do see uh, the EPR not as only a contribution, but as an investment and an incentive uh, in order to build uh, the circular industry. I hope it answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you uh, very much, Stefani. I will now go to the next speaker to follow up with the round of introduction. Um, Ilva, are you with us? Thanks. Yes. Um, so can you also uh, provide a brief overview of your organization, RenewCell, and its role within the textile value chain, and also what impact uh, will EPR have on your organization? Yes. Uh, so Renewcell is a chemical recycler based in Sweden and we are running and operating a, a plant in Sundsvall north of Sweden with a capacity of, of 60,000 metric tons of so produced pulp and recycled waste. So we recycle cotton textile waste into dissolving pulp that uh, we sell to fiber producers who in their turn produce man-made cellulosic fibers which is the next step spun to yarn and, and of which new fabrics and garments can be, can be produced. So our place in the value chain is between the collectors and sorters and, uh, and the fiber producers. Uh, and we are uh, very positive to the EPR. Uh, it, um, what we see is, the, is that the EPR fee will generate the financial support uh, in mainly to collectors and sorters in order for them to generate high volumes of validated feedstock with to, to an 
attractive price as input to our factory in Sundsvall. Uh, and of course, direct financing of, of recycling could be another option uh, or an additional option. But what is most important for us is that we can lift out some of the costs in the supply chain uh, in order to increase the, spees, uh, the speed of, uh, of um, uh, making the textile industry circular instead of, of linear. So getting support in, in, in that. Hmm. Thanks a lot so for... Uh, for presenting yourself. Uh, we'll now follow up uh, with Tanya, who will uh, present us her organization, BKN. And here again, could you briefly explain what you do, what social enterprises are, and how they will be impacted by future EPR schemes? Yes, of course. Thanks for the invitation and for the already interesting uh, presentations before me. Uh, I'm Tanja, I'm uh, working on circular economy at the Branchevereniging Kringloop Nederland, uh, which is the umbrella organization for secondhand social enterprises in the Netherlands. Uh, we're also a member of Reuse. Uh, currently, we represent 67 members and together they have more than 250 stores across the Netherlands. They are all collecting, sorting and selling textiles locally. And 21% uh, of the items collected by our members are tactile, are tactile items. The rest is also still furniture and electronics. Uh, they collect this via donations in store, textile containers, house, by, uh, house on house, and via collaborations with retailers. Uh, last year, around 30 million kilos of textiles was collected by our members. And textiles uh, account for around 28% of revenues um, and they are mostly being sold locally. Um, all the, our members have the quality mark Gurmer Kringloop Nederland, which proves that they are a professional and transparent organization with circular and social goals. Social enterprises are key enablers for the transition to a circular and sustainable textile value chain. And all the while they are creating local jobs and fostering inclusion for people distant from the labor market. Um, we are in a traditional almost end of the value chain, but in a circular economy, there is preferably no end. And therefore, we see ourselves more shifting to becoming the center of the value chain. Um, now, speaking of the Netherlands, we've had an EPR scheme in we have an EPR scheme in place since July this year, and it's still being set up. And we are an important player at the table in setting the, up the Dutch EPR scheme particularly because we are crucial in achieving the national reuse targets, which are in the Netherlands set at 50% by 2030. So we are very happy that in the Netherlands, they included national reuse targets. Um, and for the European EPR, we seen this as a means to amplify the effectiveness of our national regulations. This as the, the European EPR recognizes the important role of social enterprises for textile real use, and includes footwear, which are at the moment not included in the Netherlands, and talks specifically about eco-modulation. And because this is being talked about in Europe, this is also now a discussion in the Netherlands. Thanks a lot, Tanya, for already the overview. We'll now close uh, the round of introduction with our uh, last speakers, Felipe Carnero, um, who works for Lipor in Portugal. Felipe, are you with us? I don't hear from Felipe. Can the ESE check if he's there? Oh, Felipe is connected and should be able to speak. Well, we can let Felipe time to connect and maybe we'll now start uh, the... Um... Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Are you here? Ah, okay, something. Yes, I can hear sorry, you, sorry. great. Sorry, Marie, sorry. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. The invitation. Um, I'm from Lipor. Lipor is a, a, a company that in the north in Portugal, in the region of Porto, and we are the responsible for treatment of uh, almost uh, uh, around uh, 500,000 tons of waste every year. Our goal is to treat that that waste, and we we treat uh, with 
waste like a resource. So for us, it's very important uh, this EPR uh, scheme that we are talking about. Nowadays, what we know, we know that in Portugal, in our areas particularly, that we serve around 1 million people, and that 1 million people produce every year around uh, 200,000 tons of textile waste. That, that appears in our mixed waste nowadays. That's a big number for us. And now what we are doing, so we want to work the, to recycle, although to sorting that, that, that waste and to recycling. The first step to, that in our area that is, we are a little late in the reuse. For now, only 5% of the textile is uh, being uh, separated by citizens, by citizens to the reuse, and the rest is put in the mixed waste. The 200,000 200, tons of waste, like I said before. So our goal is to have a, a regulation that supports us, us to implement collecting systems and to uh, separate that sorting the, the, the waste textile to, uh, to give to industry. Well, as you know, Portugal is a very strong industry of textile, so for us it's very exciting this uh, this 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 waste for us, and we are um, we want to uh, to. Uh, to devolve and to achieve higher rates of recycling. So textile is very important for us. Thank you very much, Felipe. And uh, now that we know from each of our speakers where they fit in the textile value chain and how they will be uh, consequently impacted by EPR schemes, I would like to deep dive into their views uh, and recommendations on future EPR schemes. Following the same order, I will start with uh, Stephanie. Uh, my first question for you, Stephanie, is um, so we know that the WFD as a directive will leave some leeway for implementation at national level. However, the Commission's proposal uh, is to harmonize the rule at, for APR schemes at EU level. So in your perspective, how important uh, is harmonization at EU level? Well, that's a very good question. I will take an example given with the uh, EPR uh, of packaging, uh, which is not harmonized at all, <laughs> which means that we have uh, 27 different contributions, that we have 27 uh, eco different eco-modulation and 27 uh, different projects of the waste management. And for textile, uh, we want a different story. And uh, what is needed is to have a, a common project. Uh, EPR is a project. This is not a law. It's a project for the waste management and its prevention. We need to have common targets, uh, such as uh, collection rates. Uh, how do we want to collect? How do we want to recycle as a fiber? This is really important. And we also need one single uh, European new Union producer register, uh, which would ease you know, the administrative burden. And that's, I mean, we need to have this. Uh, and we also, are questioning the multiplication of the PRO in one uh, country. You know, if there are many PRO, will they be able to reach the, the goals, you know, uh, when they are in competition? Because what is important is the achievement and not to be in competition. Well, we question this. Um, we also uh, need to harmonize eco contribution uh, to have consistency uh, and the same level playing field uh, in order to have a fair contribution and based, of course, on the waste uh, costs. And then also an harmonization about eco-modulation. I talked about the, the packaging EPR. Uh, if we want to see happening for the company, we have to have the same criteria uh, and uh, we would like to have them based on the eco-design for sustainable uh, you know, product regulation and to have the same also implementations. So to conclude, the idea is uh, let's not make a new uh, packaging EPR, but let's maybe innovate uh, in in the EPR scheme. Okay, you already touched upon a lot of uh, good and important points. 
Um, another question for you will be uh, how to make sure that the EPR financing uh, systems is um, managed in the best way. Uh, because we know that this will play a very important role. Basically, EPR schemes um, aim is to finance the waste management costs. So in your perspective, how should that be done? Well, uh, first, as you said, uh, and I said it before, EPR should be seen as a project for prevention of the waste and uh, uh, its management. So first, what is the cost of the waste? This is the key. How much does it cost? Uh, we believe that the contribution should be allocated to this, uh, to the purpose of prevention and management. And nothing else. Then we need to calculate where the costs are. So first, uh, the, the contribution, if we want to, to succeed for this project, should, should be focused on the waste management. And the second point is that it should be focused on innovation. If tomorrow we want to have more of this, we need to, you know, this t-shirt is made of recycled cotton fibers. And for the industrial who are here, uh, you may know how difficult it is to, to make, to have a product of good qualities and with durable, durability, you know, criteria. And we need to identify, you know, the, the feedstock in order to, to be able to sort for recycling and we need identification. And this could be the, a tool for tomorrow. It's, uh, it could be embedded RFID. Uh, it's one of the tools of identification, but we need to crack many, many codes. And the contribution, the money that will be put on the table should be used in order to crack uh, the sorting issues. And you have to, we have to keep this in mind because we need to get industrial now. And also we need to stay agile, you know, um, a project is not set in stones. And this is why we are asking also to have a monitoring body, you know, to, to observe, you know, the EPR project every three years, because if there is a disruptive innovation, then the market will change, then the project will change. And we need to evaluate, you know, all of this uh, and to be as, you know, um, precise as possible, you know, in our, you know, funding, in our innovation project, and in our contribution. It's an investment to start, then it will be an industry. Uh, and so to conclude, uh, first, we need to focus on disruption, then on industry, and then stay agile. This is the key in order to succeed, we believe. Thank you. You started your presentation by mentioning other EPR schemes from other waste streams and mentioning that they were not perfectly functioning. So my question now is uh, basically, could EPR scheme for textile be a silver bullet or do they need to be associated with other policy financial instruments? Uh, what is your take on this? Well, I will, I will take again my t-shirt. You, know. you know, it's made of uh, recycled fibers, but what is the difference with this one and the one that I'm wearing? I mean, no one can tell today. And this, this is why we believe that the new regulation as a, a eco-design for sustainable products that will you know, give clear criteria of what is uh, possible or not in terms of eco-design, like, uh, you know, right to repair in order to, to extend the life of the product uh, and make them last longer. Uh, also, uh, the green claim, which will tell to the customers, hey, you can see what is the difference between this one and the other one, and why this one has a low, lower impact than the other and why it is highly recyclable uh, and, and how it's going, what's going to happen, what's, what's his, his, his life. Like with the DPP, for example, uh, the digital product passport, we will have a clear view and it's also in the ESPR. We need to have a clear view on the product, what are their life and what they are going to become. Uh, so, well, the purpose of, the, of those low uh, are to 
complete the EPR and the uh, you know the waste framework uh, and and the need to be connected between uh, each other. Um, and the EPR will be a tool, one of the tools, uh, in order to prevent and manage the waste, as I said. Uh, so we talked about prevention with eco-design, repairment, uh, and claiming. Uh, and then to manage the waste, we need to enhance the sorting industry and to boost the recycling industry. We need to crack the codes again. So we want more. We want to be able to do more T-shirts like this. We want our customers to know what is inside and why they are so different from the others. Uh, and we want them to be able to compare. And it will be only possible uh, with a circular industry, a strong circular industry, innovative, uh, that will prevent and then manage the waste. Thanks a lot, Stephanie. So um, you mentioned uh, two other uh, pieces of legislation, uh, the eco-design uh, regulation, right to repair. And this leads me to a question to our next uh, panelist, Ilva. Um, so we were just talking about EPR's complementarity with other policy instruments. And I would like to hear from you, Ilva, if you think that we have currently a policy coherence between the Waste Framework Directive and other policy developments, for example, uh, the JRC work on developing end of waste criteria for textile and harmony, harmonizing sorting requirements, or the ESPR, as we just talked about. The floor is yours. Yeah. No, I don't see that it's harmonized. Uh, when it comes to the GRC and the waste criteria, um, in the current outline, they have suggested that the point of end of waste for recycled textiles is when the output material from the recycling equals a fiber that is ready for conversion into textile. And at Renewcell, we are producing a dissolving pulp meaning that our end product is currently then defined as, as a waste according to the GCR and the waste criteria. And, and the majority, as you know, the majority of textile fibers are produced in, in Asia and, and many of those countries have, has banned or heavily regulated the, the import of, of waste. So this, this would mean that we as a chemical recycler producing dissolving pulp and exporting this to fiber producers in Asia would not be able to export, which would mean that all chemical recyclers or recyclers in Europe would not be able to export, which would lead to us not having any recycling in Europe. Uh, so we are strongly against uh, this um, uh, current uh, formulation. Uh, the, the product that, that we produce is uh, a dissolving pulp, which is a product that has, has existed for many years. Uh, and however, previously it has been produced uh, by a virgin material like woods, and now we are using textile waste instead. And uh, we believe that uh, our dissolving pulp should be treated the same way as, as the virgin dissolving pulp. So that's our statement on that part. Mm. Okay, so to sum up, you did agree with the JRC proposal to uh, for an end of waste criteria and point for recycling because you think it will have a big impact on the recycling capacities in Europe. Talking about recycling capacities, how do you envisage EPR scheme will uh, impact the recycling capacities? Does it have the capacity, the potential to scale up recycling uh, capacities in Europe? Yes, definitely. As, as I said before, we believe that EPR scheme will lead to um, higher volumes of feedstock into our factory. So sorted uh, feedstock, high volumes and to an attractive price. Um, and we also we are also positive to the design for circularity and and mandatory recycle content. Uh, we see that the latter will uh, will lead to a potential higher demand of our of our end product and and lead to higher uh, circularity. Thank you very much, Ilva. We'll now. 
Um, jump into our next speaker, Tanya. Um, so Tanya, your organization is a ne network of social enterprises. Can you explain to us why and how social enterprises should be supported in the transition to EPR schemes, which will impact them and uh, conduct to many changes? Yes, of course. Uh, it's, I'm happy to get this question. Um, in essence, we see uh, supporting social enterprises in the EPR scheme is not uh, just a nice to have, but it's really a strategic way to move to a more inclusive and sustainable future. Uh, we tend to look at social issues and circular issues in different silos, uh, but we really see that it's more effective to combine them and work at social and circular economy goals at the same time. Uh, our members already do this and it goes great, so they are leading by example. Uh, and yeah, I recommend uh, uh, looking more, combining these two things more often. Um, we therefore see that it's very important that the social economy is encouraged instead of discouraged by these kind of proposals. And it's very nice to see that the social economy actors are getting the recognition they deserve as key players in the upcoming EPR scheme from Europe. Um, they, this really emphasizes the pivotal role social enterprises play in textile collection, sorting and selling locally. Um, I need to stress the importance of maintaining all provisions related to social enterprises in the Commission's proposal to ensure legal certainty for the, this, this important sector. Um, as this is all great, uh, we see that there's a bit more clarity and improvement needed in some points, especially as, uh, as I've already said, social and social enterprises are seen as important in the governance of EPR schemes, but there's no specific provisions reflecting this in the legislative part of the text, which of course is a, a shame if you ask me. Um, but I want to share two great examples on how social economy players are being rewarded and how this can be done. Um, one great example is in Spain. This year, they've taken a bold step by reserving 50% of the public tenders for textile collection exclusively for social enterprises. That's a very concrete and impactful way to intertwine these circular and social economy goals. And it will be great to have these kind of stimulations in the EPR framework. Um, additionally, the EPR fee, uh, or so you already saw a question on this in the chat, uh, paid by the producers is a very powerful tool that can drive both environmental and social benefits. That, a great example is, is how they do this in Spain in their Solidarity Reuse Fund, I don't know the, the French name, where a portion of the EPR fee goes towards financing reinsertion activities of social enterprises involved in textile reuse. Um, this is also a very good uh, best practice that we believe can be expanded at EU level. Um, in essence, we see that supporting social enterprises is not just a box to be ticked, but is really strategic to move towards a more inclusive and sustainable future. I hope this answers your question. Yes, it does. Thanks for already sharing uh, some best practices and your recommendation. Now, I would like to hear from you what you think about uh, EPR's ability to enforce waste prevention. Uh, principle, which is often something that is lacking from the debates on EPR scheme. So I would like to hear from you how you think uh, we could ensure that EPR financing mechanism implement waste prevention principles and really tackle uh, fast fashion. Yeah, I think this is a very important question. Uh, that also should be asked uh, more frequently, if you ask me, as we sometimes uh, forget the big goals of these policies because we get lost in the detail. And indeed, the goal should be to move towards a circular economy and ensure waste prevention and tackle fast fashion. In my honesty, I see that the EPR is still a measure that keeps the linear economy flowing and more systemic change is needed to really make a circular economy happen. But that being said, uh, these are very complex challenges and we are very happy with the EPR and other circular economy regulations being worked on in Brussels, for example, the ESPR, uh, as it can really help get closer to these goals. 
um, but I want to highlight two important things that need to be focused on to uh, get more towards these goals. Um, it's really important that the ESPR should follow the waste hierarchy. Um, often the upper stages of the hierarchy, so so then I mean prevention, reuse and preparation for reuse, receive significantly less funding from EPR schemes compared to recycling. Uh, and sometimes they don't receive any. And we really see this as a missed opportunity as they, these upper stages yield better environmental and social outcomes and quite often also economical outcomes than recycling. Um, social enterprises, uh, especially those employing individuals distance from the labor market, require additional upfront costs for reinsertion and training of the employees. But these investments result in long term savings from welfare payments once workers from social enterprises become regularly employed. So it's a saving in the end. Um, secondly, uh, we see that it's very important to have ambitious eco modulation and therefore we are already very happy that it is discussed at European level as it's not uh, the moment included in the Netherlands. Uh, by adjusting the EPR fee based on the environmental performance of a product, we can create direct incentives for producers to design and manufacture more sustainable items. Um, for this to really happen, it's uh, important that the fee is big enough uh, to really make a difference. Uh, next to that, we see that it's important to have a volume criterion criteria to be introduced. Uh, this should be a fee based on the number of new textiles placed on the market by brand. Uh, these measures are important to really uh, counter the wasteful consumption of fast fashion items and align better with the principles of waste prevention. Thank you very much, Tanya. It was great to hear your insight on the role of social enterprises and also of eco-modulation rules. Uh, to conclude our panel discussion, I would like to invite Felipe to take the floor. Hello, Felipe, I can finally see you. See now you. without without the technical problems sorry for that <laughs> that's that's great to hear so i have a very broad question for you to begin with uh, what impact will future epr schemes have on textile waste management in your perspective for us for us it will be very important if you look now in portugal the one waste company uh, it's not to have a, a active participation in the recyclable of the textile. Now, what what happens? We have problems. We have programs for the the prevention to reuse. It's very important for us because our main goal, one of our main goals, is to reduce the productions. But after we receive uh, the the textile waste that people don't want in the mixed waste. So we receive in our in the in our case, we have a generation that we produce to use energy. But it's not our goal. What we want is what we want is that the people, the citizens, to correct separate the text and to bring to us with quality to allow us to do the sorting and to provide the material, the feedstock, to in the recyclable industry. We are in the in the middle between the citizens and the and the industry. So for that, we have to to implement and collecting systems. What we need, we need equipment on the street, beans, for instance. We need the trucks to go to collect the beans. With what you must do the sorting. And for now, it's a process that we must have uh, uh, lots to do in that area because, for instance, it's the the contaminants of the textile must be removed by manual manual, and that is very expensive. So, here at Pierre, uh, it will be very important to allow us to have the money to to implement the collecting system and to allow it us to have uh, a, pr a productivity recycling a separate system, a sorting system that allows us to give to the recyclers, to the industry, a uh, um, good product. Okay, so that is your view for a successful uh, mandatory separate uh, collection of textiles. And we know that the introduction of separate collection of textile will increase the, the volume that will be collected. 
And then in this situation, it's likely that we will need probably more technologies or innovations uh, to support uh, and scale up sorting, for example. Uh, so what innovation do you think EPR should or could uh, aim to drive? Pardon? When I look to the textile nowadays, sometimes I think we do it. And when, when I began to work with the plastics, there are a lot of plastics that in that time we thought we can collect, but after we not, it was possible to recycle. And that's in the textile where uh, it, it is problem right now. We need the collection, I will tell you, probably with other projects that we have that collect uh, paper, plastic, for instance, door to door, we can do good, good projects for a uh, collection of the textile uh, waste. So that's not the, the main the main problem. The main problem for me that I see right now, first of all, we need we need to give to the industry good material with high high high, high quality material. So for that, like Vicenzo uh, said in the beginning, it's important to have harmonious harmonized sorting requirements is fundamental for us. Second, like I told you before, when the material arrived, the, the textile, of, we need someone to remove the containers to, that to have. And the, the, as you say, and the, as you know, the textile have a lot of the buttons, the lots of material that nowadays we must be, 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 be removed from the textile to allow us to sort it with quality. So that's for me, and we need technology. Manual is very expensive, so we need automatic solutions to remove that that uh, containers contaminations that they have right now. Second, what we see, how many categories we will uh, separate the textile, because in the in the reality there are a very we can have many CQs because we have two two main parameters: the fiber and the color. So we can. And uh, after in the fibers, we have mixed 25, uh, uh, 25, 75 polyester, for instance. So it, there are a, a high range of materials. So we need some rules. What categories, what will be able to separate for us? And the other question is when we go to EPR, people will pay. And do they expect that we give a good? Uh, um, Go to go to great destination to the to the to the, to the waste. So, what we are going to do with the textile that we, that by the complexity we not will not be possible to recycle. What we do with that textile? There are so we need innovations to resolve some of these questions. Thanks for sharing your, your view on the important uh, innovation you did. Have one final question for you. Um, so textile waste is managed by a various uh, ecosystem of different actors and also depending on the countries they are operating in, it can be very different. So my question is, according to you, which actors should be involved in textile waste management and how should there be any type of cooperation between them? No. Today with the, our seminar, it's a good example. We need this involvement. There are different stakeholders. There's usually we don't work together, and we must work together to to be able to, um, to implement this system. To because we need fiber to fiber recycling. So and for this, we need all the partners. We need involvement. We have to share to share to share opinion to share our knowledge to be able to implement a efficient and the efficacy system system that allow us us and allow us to give the citizens a good response to their problems and to do the textile circular thank you very much Felipe and thanks a lot to all our speakers who brought up uh, very important uh, points, namely we spoke about the importance of harmonization of the funding system of EPR schemes, uh, policy coherence and complementary between legislative and financial tools, um, some very concrete example with the end of waste criteria, uh, we also heard from the importance of uh, the governance of EPR schemes, waste prevention uh, linked to eco-modulation. 
Uh, and finally, we ended up with a concrete example for separate collection, uh, innovation and involvement of different stakeholders. So thanks a lot uh, to our speakers for um, sharing this uh, already. We can see that there are so many issues, opportunities and challenges that are linked to EPR schemes, and which is why it's so important that we are discussing it uh, right now. I'm very happy that we managed to have such a wide range of uh, stakeholders to express different opinions. And now I would like to continue this uh, by opening the Q&A session. We received already beforehand a couple of questions from the audience and also today uh, in the chat. So um, I would like to start with um, a question uh, for Philippe, since uh, you were just uh, talking. We, we had a question about um, pub circular public procurement. And the question is, how can textile be part of circular public procurement as a form of mainstreaming circularity? So basically, how can public procurement um, help transit towards circular, circularity of textiles? Public procurement can be a very uh, the, 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 the helping to uh, to scale this this this. I can tell for reason in our company we have some requirements when we do some pro, so some uh, pro, procurement and we have some uh, requirement that we put. Uh, but it's not easy nowadays because many times when we have some we try to put some criteria of for instance um, introduction of recyclable material there are not a company there are not a lot of companies that can respond to our to our um, request so it's something that we need to work together like i told before but for now we are very very for us and the europe in portugal uh, we have a very ambitious goals for recycling. Recycling. So the main goal for me to achieve that is we must reduce the production. For me, it's very, very. Uh, without that, we will not uh, accomplish that ambitious goals. So we have to do for other, for the other hand, like I told you, for we have we. Have, and the problem is not for me. The problem is we will go to sorting. We will prepare the materials, but to to this is this economical viable. The product the product must be valued. So for me, it's very important the obligation of the incorporation of uh, recycling material in the, the production of new new textile is very important. And that also the other part of the the, the green procurement that people public uh, companies can put these criteria and to uh, uh, helping to to um, to to, to uh, the market to win some scales. Thank you, uh, Felipe. We now have a, a question on cost coverage. And the question is how high the EPR fee should be in an EPR scheme to really create an incentive to change the business model. So to go from a linear business model to a circular one. Uh, I guess this could be a question for anyone, uh, maybe. Tanya, you want to, to answer it? I don't know if there are any precise numbers, but it's more about what uh, part of the um, textile waste management or what activities should the um, EPS scheme cover? Um, yes, I think I've partly already answered it because I saw the, the question. But in the Netherlands, I don't know uh, what they are thinking of now specifically, but I think it was around um, three or six cents per um, kilos or stock. I don't I can't remember. Sorry. Uh, so it's not uh, it's, but it's I think it's becoming higher. I think Stephanie probably knows because he's putting up her hand. Yes, if I need this. Yes. Um, the idea is to have a fair price. This is why we are asking for a monitoring body, because we need to uh, to make studies, uh, science-based, industrial studies, uh, and uh, logistic studies to see uh, to, to see what is the real cost of every milestone and uh, which stakeholders uh, is in need of something. And 
uh, the contribution should only cover what is uh, today a cost. And for example, in the balance, and Tanya well knows this, the topic, uh, second hand has value. It's a market on itself. It doesn't need to be financed. But the waste management, the sorting, uh, enhance the industry, it has a cost. And if we want to, to give to the recyclers pit stock in order to recycle, we need also to finance this part. And today it's handmade, sometimes it's automatized. What we want to have all through Europe uh, is an automatized and efficient industry uh, in order to recycle more fiber to fiber. And I think the, the question can be answered today. And this is also a question of harmonization, the cost of the contribution. And first, what uh, it should uh, finance and how much it costs for everyone. Thank you. We have another question that is uh, linked to EPR fees and uh, specifically accommodation of fees. The question is how can the Commission ensure that accommodation, accommodated fees by weight will not favour synthetic based clothing? Uh, I assume that this could be a question for you, Stephanie, but also for Vincenzo. Um, I don't know which of you would like to take it first. So basically the question is um, the way we um, count textiles uh, by the quantity or the waste, since synthetic uh, textiles tend to be lighter, could this uh, favor synthetic textiles? Uh, well, uh, I don't not have the answer today, but it's a really good question because uh, uh, the idea is to talk about how, uh, what are the criteria for contributions. Uh, there is a lot of talk about this. And as my previous answer, I think uh, we need to have a very strong uh, study on this. Uh, about uh, what is the, the impact you know, of a product and uh, what is the real price you know, of the waste management. But it's really linked. You know? uh, if polyester uh, needs more treatment at the end of life, then the cost of polyester may be uh, higher. But this needs to be science-based. It doesn't come, it doesn't have to come out from, uh, you know, uh, like, like this, like a popcorn. <laughs> we need to have science-based study in order to make the, the right choice and also economical and also uh, you know based uh, on on the administrative tools we need to ease also the um, the process of declaration and uh, this is all linked you know uh, so yes of course uh, synthetic is lighter than than cotton uh, but it doesn't have the same impact so what um, and they don't have also the same process of recycling, so it needs to, to be explored. Thank you. I have a question about recycling for Ilvana. The question is, uh, is chemical recycling part of the textile waste solution? So I would like to hear what's your take on this question. Uh, I'm not sure if I understand the question, <laughs> but uh, of course we should follow the waste hierarchy and, and prioritize reuse before recycling. But if a garment cannot be reused, uh, it's a better option to recycle it than to incinerate or put it on landfill. Um, and the chem chemical recycling as such compared to mechanical recycling, I think they can complement each other. Um, I'm not sure if I understood the question, but that's my my answer to that. Yeah, it was exactly the, the question. And I think, could you maybe elaborate on how you see complementarity between chemical and mechanical recycling? I think that uh, mechanical recycling. Oh, I I no, I shouldn't do that. <laughs> but uh, I don't. I think we have different areas to cover, so to speak. Uh, and I think we should collaborate with each other, the mechanical and chemical recycling cyclers. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do. 
um, to to find a win-win situation for for both parties. But I cannot I, I can't dig into any details at this moment. Okay, I have a follow-up question uh, for you. Someone mentioned that uh, recycled materials input have a limited effect on curbing overconsumption and raw material extraction. And the question is, what are we doing to address the effective reduction of raw material extraction? So in your views, is recycling a solution to address an effective reduction of raw material extraction? Or do you see basically other ways to phase out from using only virgin fibers and materials? Um, I'm not sure if I understand the question, to be honest. Um, if I try to, to rephrase the question, I think, yes, what, how can we basically uh, limit our consumption of virgin consumption. Consumption. consumption, but also in the sense of production? How can we use less virgin uh, materials when we produce? Um, by using uh, the material that we produce out of textile waste. So instead of using virgin materials, uh, you can use the, the material that we create uh, from textile waste. Um, but of course, we should try to reduce the consumption as first step. That's always prioritized. But, uh, but for the textile waste exists, as I said before, um, compared to incineration or landfill, I think that recycling is, is uh, uh, better. Uh, but the reduction of, of consumption is always prioritized. Um, yeah. Thank you, Ilva. And I can uh, tell, tell, say also that the, the dissolving pulp that we produce, as I said before, uh, it's sold to fiber producers who produce man-made cellulosic fibers out of that. So it's modal, viscous, etc. So in that sense, we can replace virgin uh, viscous made out of woods uh, with uh, our dissolving pulp that is made out 100% made out of uh, uh, textile waste. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we heard previously, I think it was Stefan Stephanie who raised the, uh, the issue of having multiple or just one PAO, so Producer Responsibility Organization. And we have a question here, uh, which is, is the idea that there will be one PAO per member state or multiple? So that would be a question for Vicenzo. Um, is there any reference to this uh, in the Commission proposal? Or is this something that could be um, left to the member state to decide? Uh, yes, here I am. Um, in principle, uh, member states, one single member state can have more than one uh, pros. Um, if I'm not wrong, um, it should be written now in set down in the Article 20, 20, 22.0. Point C of uh, the Commission proposal. Um, uh, so this is uh, something that could also boost, trigger a little bit competition between PROs and uh, having an alignment of different uh, fees for EPRs. Um, regarding the questions that is in the chat now, um, I don't I, I understand exactly uh, what uh, they refer to the funding for the upper part of the West hierarchy. What kind of funding they refer to? This uh, it's not clear to me. So I, I don't have exactly figures. What I can say is that the West hierarchy and obviously the West Framework Directive it gives um, uh, it's aligned with the West hierarchy. So we prefer options that in include preparation for reuse and reuse rather than uh, incineration or landfill. Landfill it's not even uh, an option per se. So, but I don't exactly what kind of uh, uh, funding that refers to. So sorry about that. Um, thank you. I cannot see the chat, but I, I'm assuming the EPR fees 
they were that was a reference to EPRV in general. Um, I have a follow up question on the um, the one that I was asking about uh, PROs. Um, the the question is: Can existing PROs um, extend their responsibility to handle more project groups such as textile? So, for example. Um, PAO that are already in place uh, that deal with the packaging or we or the other waste streams, could they potentially now take care of textile as well? I don't know if you have the answer to this question, uh, Vincenzo. Uh, sorry, sorry, it was for me the question. Yes. <laughs> so, no, because could I was I reading, sorry, I was reading the chat. <laughs> I can, can repeat. Yes, yes, very short, short, uh, please. No. Sorry, I should have specified. Uh, the, um, but the question is to know if existing PAOs that deal with um, other waste streams, for example, packaging or uh, mm. plastic weeds, could now take care of textile in addition to the waste stream they are dealing with. Well, I, I cannot give a um, precise answer to this, but uh, I can say that the West Framework Directive refers to uh, producers of textile. So uh, I, I guess it's going to be difficult uh, to to have uh, the same PROs uh, dealing with different kind of waste streams because the idea is having to have EPR scheme for producer of textile, as defined out in the West Framework Directive. Um, this is my in, in interpretation. Uh, we have to also maybe ask better to uh, my legal colleague is uh, this is correct. But uh, as long as it refers only to textile producer or textile, I see it uh, dif a difficult option to be implemented. Thank you. Since we are talking about uh, PRO, maybe Sina, you would like to elaborate on one of the models that uh, were developed in the report, the one about uh, competing PROs. Um, what is your perspective on this model? Do you think it would be uh, a good model or would it have issues? Could you elaborate on this? Yes, I think um, the systems and competition uh, is a very good model. So, um, yeah, we have we don't have uh, this issue with um, the antitrust aspects there when you only have one system. And I think it's okay because the packaging system in Germany also have more systems. So um, it will be the same for textiles, perhaps. Thank you for the answer. We have a question about targets in the chat. Uh, it's a question for Tanya. Uh, could you tell more about the reuse targets of 50% uh, in the Netherlands? Uh, is it something that is only for textile? And does it refer to the amount of collected textile material that is uh, sold in the Netherlands or also outside? Like, Can, can this be also export? And a final question, what is the reuse uh, rate for the moment in the Netherlands? Yes, uh, thanks. I already answered it in the chat as well, but as not everyone is probably reading it, I will uh, also answer it this way. Uh, I wish it was 50%, uh, but it's 15. Uh, these numbers are always uh, a bit close to each other when, when talking and not being a native English speaker. Um, so it's 15% and it's really only for textiles uh, that are that have to be sold in the Netherlands. And it's based on the amount of textiles put on the Dutch market. Um, so I hope that clarifies it a bit better. And at the moment, I already showed before, I'm not the best in remembering specific numbers, uh, but we are below 10% as 10% is a target for 2025. And that is uh, quite challenging and ambitious to to get towards. But uh, our members already uh, are higher than ten percent. But it's of course for the for the entire Netherlands. Thank you. And sorry again, I cannot uh, see the no, no chat. Worries. So, but it's good more people. If everyone uh, everyone knows. I have a question for Ilva. 
um, that the manufacturer of dissolving pulp have the same environmental impact of virgin pulp. And the question refers specifically to uh, water use, CO2 footprint, uh, chemical used. Um, I don't know that, to be honest. Okay. I understand the question, but I don't, uh, I don't know. A short and clear answer. Thank you. Um, we have another question for Vincenzo. I hope you, sorry, I was yes. muted. Yes, hope you did not answer it already in the chat. Uh, so we know separate collection will be mandatory starting from 2025, but EPR may take until uh, one year after that, 2026, or even two years, 2027, to be operational. Um, so how the cost of collection, sorting, and treatment of waste will be covered in this uh, time gap? Well, uh, for the moment, I just can say that this obligation of uh, setting up separate collection for this textile comes from the uh, Waste Framework Directive uh, uh, that is in force now, that was revised in 2018. And this says that our members, uh, member states that should ensure uh, separate collection systems. For, for the moment, uh, this is the only uh, provisions that I can refer to. Uh, Obviously, the, the 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 new proposal is also trying to address this uh, issue of covering the costs by in setting up EPR schemes. Uh, there are already some member states that have EPR schemes, like uh, France and the Netherlands and Hungary, if I'm not wrong. So in that case, it would be easier for the other member states. At the moment, uh, there is this obligation, but there are no the obligation of, of having EPR schemes. So there's um no it's not a comprehensive reply, but this is what I've thank you for clarifying already. We have another question about the policy process. And uh, the question is how will the upcoming uh EU election affect the progress of the West Framework Directive? <laughs> this is very <laughs> I have uh, not a crystal ball to say how this will be affected. Uh, we have uh, starting now, um, we have some initial discussion uh, uh, with the legislators, uh, especially for the food part, we are, the, we are quite advanced. And for the textile part, uh, there are already a number of amendments that have been uh, um, published uh, and reported by the MV Committee of the European Parliament. So the discussion is there, how the next uh, European Parliament will affect the, the discussion is still early to say. Uh, we have uh, another um, presidency of the European semester starting in January. So there are many things that are ongoing. Um, we have to see how this will evolve and how uh, also the uh, the agenda will be set by the uh, the different presidencies in terms of priority. So, but we are there. The discussion is ongoing, and uh, we are following the file ops. Thank you. We have another question that I think would be for you, Vincenzo. Uh, this time is about um, export of textile waste uh, and used textile, more specifically. Um, so uh, the question is how the EPR is going to impact the global secondhand clothing trade. Uh, the question is specifically mentioning uh, a report from Changing Markets Foundation and uh, specifically about uh, fashion from fossil fuel, but basically in terms of um, of financing, how will the EPR potentially or not finance uh, the second-hand global market? Well, uh, the, 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 like the EPR obviously is putting, um, uh, let's say, is, is, is giving responsibility to producers to design produ uh, products in a way that um, lasts longer and easy to recycle. So the, the overall aim is to reduce waste, textile waste and to reduce um, uh, in this way also the um, export uh, of uh, waste 
takes a waste, if not uh, waste that can be uh, reused. I mean, taxa that can be reused, that is not waste. Uh, for this, I would say that it's more relevant the recent uh, um, uh, agreement on the uh, waste shipment regulations that puts uh, some limitation about the exports to uh, third countries of EU waste. So basically, waste cannot basically be exported, more or less, uh, making it very simple. Um, and also uh, simplify the, I mean, try to modernize the um, uh, uh, exports of waste among member states. So I hope that overall, the uh, also the uh, provisions that um, uh, and included in the Commission proposal for the Waste Framework Directive uh, would limit uh, what we call now illegal uh, waste shipment, where uh, 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 waste is um, uh, shipped uh, as if it was uh, textile to be reused. So these are there are some provisions there, and not linked necessarily to the APRs, but to the management of textile waste. Thank you. We have um, less questions coming now, so I would like to conclude with two questions. One is about uh, recycling and recycled um, content, and the last one is on degrowth. So for the question uh, on recycled material, this could be for Vincenzo and also for Ilva. Um, the question is, um, recycling industry will need to be able to sell its product. So is there a, any plan for a minimum content of recycled material for new garments? So that would be the, the question for Vincenzo. And then, uh, Ilva, I invite you to, um, to answer and comment if this is something that you find relevant and would like to see. Well, if at the moment there, there is no such requirements in the West Framework Directive, in the Revision West Framework Directive. We have to see what will come out uh, of the um, Delegation Act that will be adopted following the ESPR, the Eco Design for Sustainable Product Regulation, for which a provision agreement was reached just this night, and textile is one of the priorities. So, uh, but for that will be a delegation now, so there will be studies ongoing and see how uh, a textile will be dealt uh, with, within this uh, specific regulation. But at the moment, uh, for the in the West Promo Directive, there are no such requirements. Um, and from my side, the mandatory recycle content would, of course, increase the demand on our product. So we see that as a very positive thing from the re a recycler's perspective. Thank you both. Uh, in the meantime, a question uh, popped up in the chat. Uh, this is a question for uh, Tanya, I guess. Is the Dutch EPRV high enough to create an impact? Uh, what do you think of that, Tanya? Did you already have the time to analyze uh, and have concrete impact assessment? Yeah, it's a bit difficult to say. I really understand the question. Uh, in my feeling, it's uh, not high enough to really make a big difference because it doesn't make a big enough, in my opinion, yeah, I think it doesn't make a big enough difference for uh, the producers. Uh, to really start doing stuff differently. Um, but yeah, time will tell. But there, I, there's no, I don't know if it's going to be increased. It really depends on if by this amount of money they can um, pay for everything that they need to pay for. Um, so no increase is seen at the moment. There will be eco-modulation though. Um, so that will change something. But the discussions are really still, the discussion has haven't really started yet about the the pricing in the Netherlands. Uh, that's why I'm struggling a bit to answer this question. Thank you. Finally, I would like to conclude with one question that we received uh, beforehand uh, from the registration. We already talked about uh, ecomodulation, circularity, uh, waste prevention. Uh, but we didn't talk about uh, degrowth. And the question is, how will 
future EPR schemes address degrowth uh, within the textile sector, which uh, the person referred at the, the most pressing issue. So this is a question open to all the participants. Um, how, what do you, how do you perceive uh, degrowth for the textile sector and how could EPR contribute to it? I know that Tanya, you referred previously to a volume criterion based on uh, the eco-modulated fee. Uh, I assume that would be one idea, but so maybe you want to further elaborate on this or anyone have uh, other suggestions? Um, for me, I think it is really important. I'm happy that you're saying this to look more into the growth because it's the only way to really go away from fast fashion. Uh, I think but I don't necessarily now know how to get there because I think there's still also a lot to um, to research there and how to yeah how it can be done. Um, but I think it's also campaigns on like changing people's behavior that they don't want to buy that much and also having less um, less season changes uh, in the shops and this kind of stuff. But is it all blurbing without thinking out of my head? Thanks, Tanya. Shots, please go ahead. Thank you for the floor. Um, I think so. The customer organization has uh, organizations has a, a very big role in 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 teaching the people in in showing very good examples of uh, of less product buying usage and reuse of the, of the products. Uh, we wrote about this into our opinions and. Gen more generally, I think so. The EPR scheme um, helps uh, the the producers uh, and the manufacturers to have the responsibility over the products. So, so I think so. It can cover the collection, the recycling, and the proper disposal uh, of the products, and it will reduce waste uh, directly by that by that EPR scheme. scheme. So. That's why it is important to to have everybody uh, uh, below that EPS scheme to to have the responsibility uh, over over the products. Thank you. Thank you. So basically, shared responsibilities, governance again, very important. I think Stephanie, you wanted to comment on this too, or am I mistaken? Yeah. Um, I think uh, if we want to, to do differently uh, and to go in the more circular and then uh, have less impact on, on the industry, uh, we need to have an industrial secondhand um, area because uh, secondhand will allow us to, uh, to sell less new products. But today, uh, it has not been cracked, you know. You don't see as uh, you don't see secondhand in, in stores like uh, in all all kind of company. We need to have more. We have already secondhand product, but we need to have more secondhand product. And in order to get that, uh, we need to have an industrialized process, which is not uh, today uh, cracked. So we hope that the EPR scheme will allow us to, to go deeper in this uh, kind of business economic. Uh, and also um, the criteria that are set by the eco-design uh, for sustainable product regulation will also help, you know, uh, in order to have better products on the market because it will ban, you know, products that are not, uh, you know, recyclable, that are not repairable, uh, and that that not um, allow the the market to have sustainable products. So we believe that there are two keys. Uh, this is the two keys: secondhand industry and str strong criteria on eco design. Thank you very much um, for commenting on this. Uh, we have actually. A uh, very final question, which is for Vi Vincenzo, and it's about um, donation. So um, I think the question refers to the JRC uh, work 
on developing end of waste criteria for textile, which uh, considers donation as uh, outside uh, the waste legislation. And um, the question is um, if the Commission would be in favor of systematically obliging um, new players who receive donation to be under contract with local waste treatment operator. So basically, uh, Vincenzo, could you maybe clarify what is the Commission take on uh, donations and the waste status? Uh, well, I, I don't really think I can provide a, a, an answer to these questions. The work of the GRC is ongoing um, and there are uh, consultation uh, uh, open at this moment. Um, in the in the Commission proposal of West Fram, uh, or the revision of West Fram Directive, uh, we don't refer to a donation of uh, textile. Um, we just said that uh, textile uh, is considered waste at the collection point and, and only after a, a professional sorting of the waste, the one that can be, can be reused is no longer uh, considered waste. So this is at the moment what stands in the, uh, in the, um, in the way in the pro commission proposal for the West Promo directive uh, then also that we, we have to uh, there are still uh, uh, discussion ongoing uh, um, linked to the end of waste criteria as uh, was uh, correctly said before but also uh, on the um, ESPR and uh, uh, the, uh, the, the eco design uh, a part of the product. So, but in terms of donation at the moment, there is uh, no specific uh, provisions, as far as I know, I hope I'm not wrong, in the West Promo, in the revision of the West Promo Directive. Thank you, Vincenzo. That was our last question. We're a bit uh, before time, which is quite rare. So, I will uh, give yourself back five minutes of your time. Uh, to conclude this uh, fruitful discussion, I would like to thank all the participants, all the speakers. Um, thank you for sharing your perspective on this important topic. I would like to also thank the co-organizers of this webinar, my colleague Jana, um, Carla Valeras from Eurocommerce, Julia Blees from Uric, Alba Moulin and Erika Masi Kinvicius uh, from Generation Climate Europe. Uh, thanks to all of you for tuning in today and uh, raising such interesting uh, questions. Um, I just want to raise that uh, if you miss some part of the session, you will be able to rewatch it uh, on the EU Circular Talk webpage. Thanks a lot, everyone, and have an excellent afternoon.